All right. Greetings, everybody, and happy President's Day. It's the day we sell you. Just, just respect to all the presidents out there. Shout out to all the presidents. Not Alive just America. Dead. Other countries. Uh, also presidents of companies, homeowners associations, chambers of commerce. <laughs> you guys are the real stars. Yeah. Uh, the president of CAP, former president of CAP, Nero Tandon. <laughs> um, and most especially Trump, our most recent president. <laughs> She used to be the president of CAP, and now she's the president of no CAP. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I hope everyone is uh, staying safe and warm on this President's Day. As much of the country is blanketed by a, a frigid ice storm. Um, but you know what? It's crazy uh, because of the harsh weather conditions. Can you believe it? Uh, the podcast, they said if I came in today, they would uh, Uber me a car. They'd pay for a President's Day mattress, a hotel, and give me a $2,500 bonus. This snow got Chapo yeah. acting brand new. Yeah, I actually, um, I own a chain of podcasts in the Houston, Dallas area. There's opportunities around us every day. But I would like to introduce, it's uh, me, Matt, and Felix today. But uh, joining us today are posting and podcasting power couple, the Brunigs, here to uh, help us celebrate the President's Day and all of the presidents. Matt and Liz, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having us. You have both been individual guests of the show, but never before uh, joining us together um, as 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 the full Voltron, the full the full Brunig, the Brunig vision, Brunig vision. No, well, I think when I came on the first time, that very early episode, Matt was still punished. Matt, he had just uh, the you know the late unhappiness had just happened. On yeah, he couldn't be on the show because he was in stocks uh, in <laughs> the middle of Dupont Circle. Yeah, we were also holding him accountable. I'm going to be honest, until this moment, <laughs> I thought one of you was a character the other one was playing. I wasn't sure which. Now I hear you both. And uh, no, I apologize. I hold myself accountable for once. <laughs> for once in your life. Yeah. Um, Usually I'm the one holding people accountable. Yeah, now you got to do a growth. Yeah. Well, we'll be, we'll be growing and accounting today. But I guess I'd like to kick things off with uh, Matt and Liz to talk about like just what what is the state of like proposed stimulus spending on on like and covid relief here in america because it seems you know the the second impeachment trial uh seems to be wrapping up uh the way we all expected it would with um everyone declaring uh trump guilty but not accountable rather than what i believe he is um not guilty but should be held accountable um <laughs> And I, I guess, like, so like, like, so like, th that was the big thing they had to focus on. But like, n now that that's sort of fading into the background, and Trump's finally going to go away, the Democrats and the Biden administration are stuck with this two thousand dollar, fourteen hundred dollar check issue. And I guess, like, uh, Matt and Liz, to begin, like, how do you, how would you describe this sort of strange situation we have now, where thanks to COVID, um, basically every mainstream economist agrees that we need some kind of stimulus, and Trump has already got the ball rolling. Uh, by sending people checks couple, once or twice. And then thanks to the election and a special election, uh, Democrats really tied themselves to this idea of more checks or a $2,000 check or a $1,400 check in such a way that people were allowed to think that policy could involve the government directly giving people money. So how do you see the Democrats now attempting to manage those expectations in the current bill that's being proposed? Yeah, well, they they seem to have decided that the amount of money that it would uh, that would you know if you add up the fourteen hundred multiplied by uh, you know the number of people in the U.S. that that would that would simply be too high, and it's sort of unclear why you know like what what is the target? How do we know how much is too much? That's not really specified, but we but but there is some sense it is too much, um, and so what they've decided to start doing is aside from cutting it from 2000 to 1400 which as you know there was a big debate well we meant 1400 all along it's 1400 plus 600 I, you know i don't know i don't really care about i guess that it seems like if you get yourself in a situation where you have to explain to people you meant 1400 all along you're not doing <laughs> politics correctly <laughs> yeah um, yeah i mean cuz i think like they could, they were probably technically correct but like they can't you, you can't get around the fact that like they ran a zillion ads and political speeches where they said a $2000 check is coming your way if you vote for us and like the problem is that people took them literally and believed them if you send john and the reverend to washington 
Those $2,000 checks will go out the door. We will be able to pass $2,000 stimulus checks for the people next week. We'll deliver the $2,000 stimulus checks. And that begins with the $2,000 stimulus. When you send me and Reverend Warnock to the Senate, we will pass those $2,000 stimulus checks. You send me and Reverend Warnock to the Senate, we will pass those $2,000 stimulus checks. They will make decisions about whether we give people a $2,000 check. We need to pass $2,000 stimulus checks and if you have to get in a situation where you're saying like oh well actually it's your fault for taking it literally instead of um reading further you've yeah you've put yourself on the on your on the back heel to start yeah so but now what's interesting is they're saying even the 1400 is too much um and so they're trying to cut it down but they don't want to cut the 1400 dollar amount and so they're they're in like kind of interesting um, like metaphysical trouble in which they're saying well all the other checks have started to phase out on people who make more than seventy five thousand a year, or if you're married, one hundred and fifty a year. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to just bring that threshold down to maybe fifty thousand or maybe forty thousand. And so we're still going to provide the fourteen hundred, which plus the six hundred gets you two thousand. But we're going to phase it out more quickly, so people who, you know, a year or two ago, the last time they filed taxes, were making more than seventy five a year or one fifty a year, they won't get as much as they, uh, you know, they won't get the full fourteen hundred. And the thing about you know, him is that you can't take Biden literally. You have to take him seriously. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I kind of posed the question to them, like, what if you kept the 1400, but you only gave it to one person like as a lottery? <laughs> and, like, would that be would you would you satisfy your promise? Because of 1400 plus 600, that's 2000. Right. Like the weird position they've run themselves in is in order to make the argument that by 2000, we always meant 1400 all along. What they meant is in that last bill that passed where, the, where it said 600, that they wanted to put 2,000 there. But in the last bill that passed, it was phasing out starting at 75,000, not phasing out at 50,000. So for them to change the phase out, they're no longer able to now say, oh, well, we always meant all along, we just wanted that 600 to say 2,000, because they're now changing another parameter of that same law. So you know, through this process, something has been lost. I don't know where they've, uh, you know, where you want to ping them, but they, they've broken some kind of promise, like technically. Um, I mean, I don't know that it matters, but, you know, like logically it doesn't hold together. And I mean, like, and it's, it's, it's like a lot of things. It's, it's being justified on this idea that like, is it really at a time when so many people desperately need uh, relief or some, some cash in their checking account, like, is it the best use of uh, government money to send it to people who technically may not need it? And like, by that, they mean like, you know, I guess an individual making over $75,000 a year as based on the last time they filed taxes, which wouldn't account for the, the, the fucking plague that's just destroyed the country. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. And I, there's been a lot of discussion about I don't know how do you how do you target need in in this context, and it seems like everyone in the discourse, especially among um, kind of Democrat policy people, they've decided that unemployment insurance that's the thing that definitely targets need. But you know, when you look at the numbers, like the last month of data, there are about five million people who are receiving unemployment benefits, but in the jobs report, there are ten million people who are unemployed who are actively looking for work. So. Uh, obviously, half the people are not are not managing to get on that program. At least half the people, because um, that ten million doesn't include people who just have given up looking for work altogether. And then the other thing is that unemployment benefits. You know, I mean, you can get unemployment benefits and still be relatively well off. You know, if your spouse didn't lose their job and they make a lot of money, you could still get unemployment benefits. That's not a bad thing, but it's it's not like everyone who's unemployed is destitute. Some people they have lots of savings, or they have a spouse who has a lot of earnings. And so that's not necessarily that well targeted either. So, you know, I don't know. To, to my mind, like you try to get as much money as you can out through as many channels as, as you can, knowing that the unemployment system doesn't work all that well. A lot of people are slipping through those cracks and also knowing that a lot of people are probably going to slip through the cracks of sending out another IRS payment. But, you know, like Donald Rumsfeld said, you, you go to war with the with the army you have and, and these are the institutions we have. And as best as we you know, can do is you just kind of jam all the buttons and, and see if we can get the money out and keep people from, you know, starving and getting evicted. Well, I mean, if, if, if like the, the, the defenders of, of the Biden administration or the sort of just give them a chance crowd will point to, you know, like that what's, what's being proposed is a, a $1.9 trillion economic relief package. And I'm just quoting from the Washington Post here. It says, under the proposal, the Internal Revenue Service would provide $3,600 over the course of the year per child 
under the age of six, as well as three thousand dollars per child under of the ages sixteen to six to seventeen. The size of the benefit would diminish for Americans earning more than seventy five thousand dollars a year, as well as for couples jointly earning more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars per year. An analysis by Columbia University researchers of Biden's proposal found it would cut the number of children in poverty by as much as fifty four percent, the equivalent of five million children. Uh, like, I mean, that that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Like, I mean, is is there anything else what's being proposed here? Like, it, it sounds like it's a, like a decent thing that you would want from a Democratic administration. But like, is the devil in the details here? What's what's really going on with this? Yeah. So that's a so that's a separate thing from the fourteen hundred dollar checks. This is the uh, creation of a fully refundable child tax credit. Um, and they've been uh, this has been kind of in the works for the past three or four years. Uh, there was a bill called the American Family Act that was introduced by Sherrod Brown and uh, Michael Bennett in the Senate. And they just kind of seizing upon this opportunity. Maybe we can get it in. Um, we'll get it in a temporary one year version. And, you know, I do think that that proposal does make a very big step forward, at least like within kind of the welfare state world of like American politics, because right now the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit are designed so that poor people can't get the benefit. And that's like an intentional thing they've been doing since the 90s because they want to get, you know, poor single mothers working and all the rest of it, right? Um, and the child tax credit that they're proposing now kind of crosses that uh, crosses that line for the first time, at, at least since the 90s, and says, no, no, we actually want poor people to get benefits as well, not just like lower middle class people and above. And so that was great. That was a good uh, move, you know, in the right direction. The thing that they're starting to uh, mess up, or at least uh, that I, I, I've been kind of hammering them on over the past few weeks, is that it really just doesn't make sense to administer a benefit like that through the IRS. The IRS doesn't make monthly uh, payments to people. It makes annual lump sums uh, to people. Uh, and the child tax credit is an annual benefit. It's based on annual characteristics about a family, about their income, their marital status, whether the kid lived with them for 51% of the year. It doesn't make sense to try to do that on a monthly basis. It's just, it's just going to be a mess. It's not just me saying that. The Tax Policy Center, which is like Urban and Brookings Institute, they say the same thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't know. It's just like, typical dumb guy stuff. It's like you guys are getting very close to something that could work very well, which have been proven to work very reasonably well, at least over the last year, which is direct payments to families, direct payments to households. And But you just got to do it well. Don't make it complicated. Don't throw in all this bullshit. Just do it as simple and as clear as you could. Um, and they're just resisting that for some reason. And the net result of that is going to be is it's just going to be much less effective than it would otherwise be. So, I mean, I had a piece out today showing that uh, one in three poor children uh, live in families that don't file taxes. But you have to file taxes to get this benefit. So now we get, we're already setting ourselves up for like a losing battle <laughs> to be like, how do we reach these one in three kids? How do we get them to file taxes? And it's like, why are we even doing it like that? Yeah, make you know? them file out a W-2 and they go to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do it in the... Uh, yeah, you... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you could do it in the, at the turn them into uh, employers, employees, and stakeholders of the local ins educational institution. And maybe you know, if they want to clean up the cafeteria while they're at it, they could do that. Yeah, that was a Newt Gingrich thing. He was saying, yeah. "Have poor poor kids do the custodial work at, at their school." <laughs> make them the, man, the man was ahead of his time in many ways, <laughs> not just about that, but like the Crunchwrap Supreme at McDonald's. Also, <laughs> he was the, he was the first speaker of the house to have a smooth wife. <laughs> totally smooth wife that's not face tuned um but uh but, but uh but matt what, i mean what you're talking about is this sort of um like the, the the gravity of uh like uh democratic policy making and policy thinking it just seems like even if they uh ha sort of are, have their hand or on a problem or are grasping what could be a potential solution to it it seems invariably there's this sort of um camelification of of how these sort of like how to, how to deal with social problems like you know like all these uh, attachments like you know if you do x y and z if you claim this you would qualify for uh, this credit or something rather than you know the the very simple thing of just like don't make people jump through tubes for it like just directly like wire the money into a checking account like I I mean I, this is all intentional right I mean this is this is like what what it, what accounts for this like. The Democrats or liberal solution to like every problem has to be solved through tax credits. 
Yeah, well, so historically, you know, what happened in the 90s, of course, when they got rid of aid to families with dependent children, which was the cash benefit for uh, out-of-work single mothers, there was a move towards tax credits. And there were two, like, main reasons for this. One is that if you do it uh, through the tax code, then it's not seen as welfare. And so you think, oh, well, this will be better because middle-class families, they don't want to feel like they're receiving cash benefits or welfare. That was like the idea. Of course, I think in the last year, we pretty much definitively disproved that because every time you ask people, did you like to receive that big check? They're like, yes, I did. Please send some more. Um, but that was the thought. So put it in the tax code. The other thing is the purpose of these tax credits as they were designed in the 90s was just simply to miss poor kids. So the best way to skip poor kids is to wait till the end of the year see which one of them are poor, and then say no benefit for you. And the way to do that would be through the tax code. That, so these programs were intentionally de designed to exclude poor kids. And at the time, the idea was, well, that'll be good because that'll encourage their parents to go work. You know, um, And I, it didn't really play out that way, but that, that was the thinking. So, and, and so what we're left with now is this, this sort of like vestigial structure where this whole tax credit edifice was constructed specifically to exclude poor kids. And so it didn't really matter that, well, poor people don't file taxes, so how are they going to get it? It's like, well, that's the whole point, right? We're not trying to get it to them. Um, but now we are here 20 years later, and in a way, they're kind of saying that was a mistake. That was a mistake. We should have never excluded those kids. But we're still going to do the same shit, the same design, the same kind of you know, <laughs> way that we've been doing it and, and hope that we can reach them through this process. And I don't know. I mean, part of it, it just seems like mindless momentum, uh, turf, turf guarding on some level with some of these institutions who have spent the last 20 years defending these programs. Um, and uh, other parts seem maybe even like pettier than that, right? Like if you make it a tax credit, guess what? That means that it falls under the jurisdiction of ways and means, which, which means, you know, House member Richard Neal gets oversight over it. And you saw, you know, he's kind of you know, a bit of a nutcase himself, as you may have seen with that Alex Morse uh, election. Um, it, like, it's just a lot of just petty shit like that, it seems like, and just just dumb stuff, momentum. I don't know. That's the best I can I can make of it. Well, I mean, as far as like the critiques of this, like, I'm assured that everybody has roundly rejected the advice of Larry Summers, who recently had like an op-ed saying, like, don't spend too much money because it'll overheat the economy. And I'm, I'm assured that people in Biden circles have rejected that but like like how, how would you describe like some of the like some of the uh, the naysayers or like what, what what's the what are the arguments people make against like th this kind of like very generous at, at a moment of real crisis like you know taking the opportunity to just simply spend money damn the consequences and give it to people and like even if that what, means like giving what, it what's money larry to people, saying about it yeah yeah or or, or people uh, yeah i mean Ill. larry's saying uh you know that we're close to full recovery and that if you dump all this money in the system it's just going to supercharge demand so much that we're going to have inflationary problems and stuff like that. Which That's been the biggest know. economic problem for the last 30 years has been inflation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's always been out sort of, of control. It was sort of unclear. Well, what if, okay, what if we had 3 or 4% inflation for a couple of years? I mean, who, what, why would anyone care? Um, like, I don't know. It, it doesn't really have any negative effects <laughs> don't you understand the, the smothers brothers show would just give you the business <laughs> yeah that that's what that's what the thing is in the movie children of men that's what happened there was three three point seven percent inflation one year and then boom no more kids <laughs> if you guys want to have uh if you guys want to have johnny carson making fun of you in his monologue uh for inflation be my guest but i don't want that fate a lot of people aren't scientific people. I consider myself a very scientific man. Women's ovaries stop working when inflation goes above 1.25%. <laughs> yeah, no, you, maybe the late night talk shows will be like, have you guys seen the price of milk? It's no longer $3. It's $3.09. <laughs> <laughs> I miss, guy, I miss uh, like gas price jokes. I like the 2008 election where John McCain made all those stump speeches about uh, how he hates paying a bunch at the pump. I think we need to bring that back. <laughs> well, I do of, remember the gas price days. Speaking of uh, speaking of children, though, I mean, like this gets into like you know, the, the, yeah, the, what I what I quoted from the Washington Post, like this this a, a, a child allowance benefit policy, American child benefit policy, and now isn't Mitt Romney co-signed something or a version of this that would basically be a a, a monthly child benefit allowance for people in this country? 
Like, it, like what, what's in the yeah, Romney so, proposal? And I've heard actually like surprisingly good reviews of um, what he's or, or what's in that proposal. Could you describe it? Yeah. So Romney basically one upped Joe on the dollar amounts. Uh, so in Joe Biden's uh, plan, you get three thousand dollars if your kid is between six and 17. Uh, Romney does that as well. If your kid is younger than that, Joe gives you 3600 Romney pumps that up to 4200 And then right before birth, Romney also gives you another 1400 where Joe doesn't give you anything. So over the course of a kid's life, you get an extra five grand under Romney than you get under Biden, which is already kind of an amusing outcome. Um, but on top of that, and the thing I've been trying to push this last few days, is Romney actually designs the benefit in a way that is uh, reminiscent of, you know, sort of social democratic countries. So rather than an advanced monthly child tax credit that depends on your income for this year, which you don't even know in advance and blah, 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 blah. He says he's just going to have the Social Security Administration send out the checks to everyone, period. No means test, completely universal. Now, if you make over 200 grand or 400 grand a year, they're going to claw, claw it back at tax time. But it's only 3% of people make that much. You know, like it's a very clean and simple <laughs> uh, a way to administer the program, in addition to being uh, somewhat more generous uh, than, than uh, Biden's proposal. Now, Romney gets into trouble where he tries to pay for it uh, by, you know, cutting TANF and stuff like that, which I even think even on balance, his plan still is better, even though it has some of those somewhat negative uh, pieces to it. Um, but that seems to be like Democrats want to focus on that. And I'm trying to focus on look at the way he's set it up. The way he set it up is good. Um, and, and I should say <laughs> the way he set it up is the way that I proposed to set it up in my family fund pack paper that I released in 2019, which I believe um, was uh, the inspiration for the way that he set it up. So I'm trying to like, come on, simple, simple Social Security Administration, stop with the tax credit stuff, send it out to everyone. Like Romney's got that under wraps. Like he, he's doing it right. Like, let's do that. What do you think accounts for someone like Mitt Romney who represents a sort of a, like a, a business conservative point of view coming around on the idea of like direct cash payments to American families or to, to basically like to make it possible for people to have families or continue to maintain them? Like, or is it an acknowledgement that like social mobility or education is not a solution to the problem of poverty? Are they beginning to realize yeah, like, what that represents for like the, the capitalism as a whole? It's a very good question. I actually don't really know what happened with Romney because you remember when he ran in 2008, was it? Or 2012? 2012. Yeah, he, he was uh, very much uh, against the, what was it, the bottom 40%, the moochers. Uh, moochers, who yeah. Uh, pay tax and that expect the government to take care of them and all that kind of stuff. Um, and now, I don't know, like with anything, people will tell you, Oh, well, all that stuff he was saying about immigrants and poor people, he didn't mean that. He was just trying to win the Republican uh, nomination. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, here he is now uh, some you know, t uh, eight years later saying we should have a universal child allowance, which uh, is more to the left than even the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, as best as I can tell, the way that this has evolved on the right wing is a few years ago, like four or five years ago, there was, you know, there's always this effort to reinvent conservatism, reinvent conservatism. We're going to have an intellectual kind of center right conservatism that will appeal to, uh, you know, uh, Ross Dow that right? um, Bar barstool and, conservatism. We talked about it just the other week. That, that's, that's the newest. Oh, effort. yeah, yeah. He and so what came out of that was the idea of creating a really big child tax credit. So instead of a thousand dollar a month, which is or a thousand dollars a year, which is what it was at the time, they were saying we should go up to thirty five hundred or maybe even forty five hundred a year. But we're still going to exclude the poor um, from this calculus. Um, and it was weird because the the arguments they used for why we need to have a big child tax credit because they can't just say hey, it'll be good. People will like it. It'll be popular. We'll win elections and it'll cut poverty. They can't say that because they're Republicans. So they invented this really weird rationale in which they said, you know, if you think about it, parents really pay two sets of taxes because they pay their own taxes and then they raise kids who also go on to pay taxes. <laughs> and so if we give them a child tax credit, we're really counteracting the double taxation of parents through this process. Maybe very, maybe kids should start paying taxes at a certain age. You know, a very small would, sort of like symbolic yeah. tax to get them used to the idea, get them get their get their skin in the game from let's say age six on. Yeah, that's uh that's something that Michelle Alexander has written a lot about the school to taxes pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
you know, based on that rationale, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense to exclude poor parents because uh, they're raised, they, they pay some tax at least, right? Payroll tax, sales tax, and they're raising a tax payer under this logic. So shouldn't you also give the benefit to them? And you would confront them with this and they would just kind of, I don't know, I got the sense of just like, you know, this is bullshit, right? Like, <laughs> like, like they didn't really seem interested in, in squaring that logic. Um, and that was picked up initially by uh, Marco Rubio and Mike Lee, and they've been big on expanding child tax credit, expanding child tax credit. Rubio is why they expanded the child tax credit in the Trump tax uh, bill. But for whatever reason, Romney was the only guy who was like, okay, let's go all the way. Let's give it to all, all families, not just sort of lower middle class and above. And uh, that is what the logic entailed based on the arguments they were using. But Rubio and Lee... I mean, they released a statement uh, a, few, a week ago after Romney released his plan in which they uh, denounced it as an abomination. So um, that's my best guess of like sort of the intellectual heritage of how Romney came came to be uh, well, uh, on this. I certainly don't want to make it seem like, you know, all, like all Republicans are coming around on this. It's, it is just it's the, the Romney proposal is a very specific thing. And there have been. Uh, a number of reactions to the Romney proposal from the right uh, arguing that it's a bad idea. And it's very interesting the terms in which they describe this bill and warn against why pursuing such a thing would be a danger or like it would be a danger to American society. And uh, but I like to get Liz in on this because I just I, I saw this tweet from this guy, Scott Winship of the American Enterprise mm -hmm. Institute, responding to the idea of the Romney proposal. And of it, he says... Uh, read Angela Rashidi on the Romney proposal. I'll give you eight minutes. She notes that the highly evil, checks notes, National Academy of Sciences found that a third of single moms with earnings would reduce their hours with a child allowance. So no! just, just in case you missed it there, the reason we can't have a, uh, a child allowance benefit is that it would possibly theoretically lead to a situation in which some single working mothers don't work as much as they currently are now. Or would reduce you know what it. That mean? Yeah, you know what that means? More homework. <laughs> More enforcement of homework, less playtime, fewer Legos, fewer Legos on the floor, no erector sets. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, TV. I, what I liked about him saying that is I don't think it occurred to him how fucking blood curdlingly evil what he was saying is. Like he was saying, like, like we can never, ever allow a situation to develop in America where sing a single working mom is able to see her kid more. Right. I mean, time was that if someone tweeted that out, you'd have no idea if they were a conservative or not. Right. I mean, because uh, the landscape politically on what single mothers or mothers in general should be doing in the United States is completely mixed up. So, you know, Matt and I have talked about this, but a child allowance or, or especially like a child care benefit that also pays out as a cash benefit if you want to stay at home gets extremely mixed responses because some people say, well, no, that that will encourage or enable women to leave the workforce, which isn't good for women in general. And then other people just don't like the price tag. One of the problems is that everybody lies about what they really think. And so it's difficult discursively to figure out where they really are. But, um, you know, I debated Larry Mead one time. He called himself the intellectual godfather of welfare reform. Yeah, he's a real sicko. <laughs> to God, yeah, now he's on race science. The godfather. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he's moved science. on to an, even, <laughs> yeah. an even more savory intellectual development. <laughs> <laughs> you come to me on this day, the day that my daughter earned between fifty-five dollars and $75,000 a year on non-employee compensation. And may your first yeah. child be a high IQ child. <laughs> may your first child have a very smooth, fine brow ridge. Uh, he, yeah, he's yeah. an interesting guy. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I just want to I'm talk sure about don't. the. the last. <laughs> <laughs> he spent his whole career on welfare reform, and he was very like straight laced guy. And I swear to God, the last thing he published, he was like, maybe the reason why uh, welfare reform didn't help get black people out of poverty is because they're lazy and they don't like to work. Um, and we just need tougher, no excuses charter schools to fix that. No, he uh, published that literally was the last thing he, he published. published it in a journal, and it was like maybe there are just differences in cultures, and you're like, all right, Larry, what are the cultures? And he's like, well, there's Northwest European culture, <laughs> and then there's the, like the global South. Okay, uh, but I, I debated him once at but Johns why, Hopkins. Wait, hold on. Then why does Nor why do Northwestern European countries allow for their people to have so much more free time than America does? It, it gets so convoluted. <laughs> it gets we so we convoluted. hear all day explaining how he tries to <laughs> <laughs> circle yeah. the square that. 
Um, you know, but what he said, you know, part of the job you do in a debate, maybe the lion's share of what you do in a debate is try to get people to come to terms with and put into words what they actually think. Most people not only cannot explain what they think, they don't even know. It's submerged. They've never asked, you know, probing questions that lead to a, a very detailed outline sense of what they believe. Now, the exception to this is Matt and other autists <laughs> um, where <laughs> there is nothing submerged. And in fact, he knows every single detail of what he thinks uh, down to like a kind of disturbing granular level. Um, and so by the end of the debate and Matt was there observing what he had said, what Larry Mead had said is, well, women who stay home with their children are fine. That's even good. Women who are single and want to spend more time at home with their children, that's not good. And the reason, he said, is because women should have to answer to someone in society. <laughs> and single mothers, because they don't have a husband to be their boss, need the Arby's manager to be their <laughs> boss. That's what he said. Yeah, everyone needs a boss. He, he did it in very communica communitarian kind of, we all should serve somebody. And the yeah, single no. mother, who does she serve without a husband? <laughs> The children, dumbass. Right, it's like, well, doesn't yeah. you serve the kids? Yeah. When you're taking, <laughs> you're taking care of kids, you're not lording over them as their CO, right? The kids completely run roughshod over you and you cater to their every whim. They're all little kings, right? You've got to do what they want or they're going to scream at you hey, and you're going to want to kill yourself. Hey, who does he think husbands and boyfriends answer to? I got news for him on that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the big boss. Oh, yeah. ball and chain. Oh, fuck. Yeah, that was, no. the, that was the less heralded John Lennon song. Man is the Arby's manager of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy is the head that wears the Burger King birthday crown. Yeah. What like I was just like, like like as compared to like like what is being proposed either in the the Romney proposal or maybe like the the slightly less generous uh, Biden and Democrat one. Like like how did like and these are, these this is just totally theoretical like like this is there's a long way from this even getting close to being passed or becoming law, but like how would how would the proposal compare to programs that are extant existing in the world today in like developed comparable nations? Yeah, so I mean the the most the closest comparison that we had that happened very recently, so we have like good data and it's a very similar country would be Canada because Canada just put in place a Canada Child Benefit. They consolidated a bunch of like tax benefits that they had and they made a Canada child benefit. It's paid out each month. Um, very similar to what, what's being proposed here. It's actually somewhat more generous than what's being proposed here, not surprisingly. And they, of course, they do studies. What happened? Did people go to work? Did people stop working? What happened? And what they found is overall, actually, work activity among women slightly increased, but it also slightly decreased among low educated women who had young kids. Low-educated mm -hmm. women who had older kids, they actually worked a little bit more. But if you had young kids who were below school age, the percentage of them that were employed uh, fell from like 55% to 53%. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, well, that's okay. The kids are like, they're not in school, so someone has to watch them. So that seems fine. And it looks like once they go to school, they get back in the labor force. So wh who, who gives a shit? Um, and that that like that's the biggest thing we have. One of the things that they were trying to cite at AEI is uh, some research from the National Academy of Sciences, which were trying to kind of like guess what this would do. And they uh, determined. I think you cited some of it, but the actual number was that they believe that unmarried mothers would reduce their work activity by an average of one point seven hours a week. Oh which my god! Would reduce. Oh my <laughs> which god! Would total, Fuck! <laughs> which would. <laughs> Would reduce total work in the economy by point zero nine percent. But this, um, wait, 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 this is that's so, this the is, type of thing that said that said John Connor back. Let <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Connor, single mother. Wait, wait, need I say more? Yeah, need go. I say more? Yeah. And then go. who who does she have to answer <laughs> to? The to. reprogrammed T eight hundred, who she finally understood what it means to have a father, a guy in her kid's life. Case closed. Does she marry him? I haven't seen her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. So. I mean, she has, she has to watch him be lowered into a uh, vat of uh, molten steel. It's very sad. But, you know, a well, spiritual marriage. It, it, that's, 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 what a good, that's what a good yeah. marriage is like. <laughs> Every day, the husband and wife 
take turns being lowered into the vat. Every but, day when Matt logs onto Twitter, I see him being lowered into the vat. It's just a thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs, <laughs> thumbs up. Thumbs <laughs> up. Yeah. No, I'm loving what, it. But what I was going to say is like, <laughs> this is this is just so bizarre to me because it's like, okay, like, yeah, even if you like, like t- tally up all the studies and show like, oh, like uh, economic output will drop by 1.7 hours a week among like like the, like this, the uh, you know, single mothers of this uh, income level or what age or whatever. Like, it, don't they have numbers to show that like what like the over the long term, like the, the net positive, just purely in terms of like capitalist economic growth, like what it would mean to have more uh, mothers, I don't know loving their children and raising them or being in their lives oh yeah they become like stable functioning adults in like an economy yeah i mean the the big counter here would be that when kids grow up in poverty they're much less likely to be employed when they become adults and they're also much more likely to be incarcerated do crime have mental health problems etc etc so like if your whole goal was over the long term maximize the number of people who are like productive citizens Keeping people, especially children, out of poverty, that's like one of the first steps you're going to take because poverty really uh, plays a a number on the brain and brain development and malnutrition and all the rest of it. So like in that sense, it it could never make sense that uh, you you, you would uh, get your way to high employment by uh, having one in five kids grow up poor. It would never make sense to do that. But they sort of just kind of shuffle that off and focus narrowly on what about the small group of uh, low educated mar- unmarried mothers who have you know uh, you know a kid who's below the age of 3 and just like just obsess 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 over that i think it's a shell game though i think that i think you know all of this talk about what would happen uh, you know in terms of women's progress in the workplace and what would happen in terms of economic productivity, all of these, all of these things. It's not that I think people don't believe them. I just think that there is a, a a sort of grander and more historical motive that you can easily identify, especially in the welfare reform conversations. And it's that the American right and the American left do not want poor people having children. They think those people are messed Mm -hmm. up in some kind of way and they don't want more of them in society. That's all there is to it. Yeah, that was the, you know, dysgenic Charles Murray uh, under underbelly of the whole welfare reform. Right. Um, and you, you, I saw that reappear very briefly when they were doing the, like, Reformacon child tax credit thing I was talking about earlier with Rubio and Lee. The guy who wrote their policy, his name was Robert Stein, and he gave an interview to Ryan Cooper at The Week. And Ryan asked him, why don't you include, like, the poorest in here? And he said, well, we don't want to encourage fertility among the bottom quintile any more than we already do. <laughs> yes, that is that is Ugh. what they believe. Well, that's okay, like they, usually something that's usually something you say when it's like you've all morphed back into reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you've got James Bond like chained to like a laser that's slowly cutting into his dick. <laughs> No, yeah. Mr. Bond, I expect you to not I expect you to lower the fertility rates <laughs> among our poorest. Among, uh, uh, among super rich people, uh there are uh tons of like charitable foundations. I, I believe there is an arm of Warren Buffett's foundation in fact that are aimed at population control, like yeah. expressly, especially in the global south. Gee, but I wonder why do so that, many people you know, are conspiracy theorists in contemporary American society? <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, no. That was a huge. That was a huge, like Gates Foundation thing too. They were like, "Oh, the biggest problem in sub-Saharan Africa is overpopulation." Yeah, right. Right. Even though every every single one of those people has a fucking carbon footprint like ten thousand times smaller than Bill Gates's like pinky toe. But yeah, Yeah. like, uh, but foreskins, please, Africa, cough them up. That was that was (laughs) such a great. I always I've been talking a lot about the creative department of the NWO a lot because they've done amazing work in the past year. But the best thing they ever did was like making Bill Gates into like um, a Reddit meme in the way that they did Keanu Reeves. Where yeah. it's like he's the epic science guy and not like one of the fucking worst people alive and just like expressly evil. Just expressly, just openly like, yeah, no, we have to, we have to keep sub Saharan Africans from breeding. Yeah. But like, no, I mean, I think that that's a widespread <laughs> across yeah. political tendencies well, yeah. sensibility that's. Liz, you yeah. said like, you know, on, on, on the left and the right. And like, you know, as far as what the right wing believes, like, that's pretty easy to parse out. Like, they, they just don't care. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if poor people keep having children in horrendous conditions and, and entering into like this unbreakable cycle of poverty or whatever, like that, that it's irrelevant to them. And they, it, to the extent that they're aware of it, they'd like more, please. 
But from like a, a liberal or progressive or even left wing policy perspective, like how do those how does that same feeling sort of manifest itself of just like, oh, like the, those people, you know, they should just really like not have kids or like that's like the problem is them just, oh, they just keep having kids, you know, well, like that then that they're like that, they, that needs to be dealt with or sort of disincentivized in some way. Yeah. So the left and right, you know, think of if you if you think about the Twitter tradition of making up a guy to get mad at. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much 60 <laughs> percent of politics. Um, but I think when the right wing makes up a guy to get mad at in terms of population, they make up an inner city person like a black mother with several children who maybe isn't in work or has multiple jobs or something like that. And you can see a lot of really disgusting shit to that effect being said right out in the open during the welfare reform debate. I mean, they weren't as shy about Read it any issue time. of the New Republic um, under uh, yes. fucking uh, what's it, Marty Peretz's tenure. Right. The, New Republic, the New Republic until like 2015 was awesome. <laughs> every, front, <laughs> every front page was like, is there a new type of black guy? <laughs> Should we just like <laughs> should you kill yourself mag of Air Force if, One. yeah if you make forty thousand dollars a year should you kill yourself <laughs> and uh, yeah and the, uh, all the wars ranked <laughs> um but i i think when when you know folks on the left make up a guy to get mad at in terms of child having they imagine like a fat suburban woman who has like a karen haircut and drives a minivan and her carbon footprint is just enormous. And also she might be a conservative and she goes to church and has sort of chiclet fake nails and all that kind of shit that's tasteless and gaudy that, you know, I think you I'm think already about pissed the off at this average, person, Liz. I'm already I'm Right, already right. So I mean, you think about I the fucking hate her. <laughs> the Sam B, the average Sam B viewer is not going to like this person. Right. Who's like, I just love God and my country. I don't understand what everybody's complaining about. And so when they think about a you know, a minivan full of kids, that's who they're thinking about. So every time Matt posts about his his family fun pack, for instance, you know, he gets hit with a wave of, uh, excuse me, we don't need more children. It's actually unethical and even morally wrong to have children. We're overpopulated as it is. And it kind of takes that form. But if you tease it out and, you know, start actually asking well who should get to have them then because we need some like what are you going to do then you start hearing more and more about sort of uneducated um you know tasteless suburbanite middle american you know trumpy people and that's who they don't want receiving uh, child benefit just just who are you to claim or demand that families are supposed to be fun Families are the opposite of fun. <laughs> Families are for for misery and and fucking you up, as Philip Larkin said. But I mean, I I guess I guess just to, just move on quickly. But this this isn't this is an easy segue as long as we're talking about people who are uh, bitter, uneducated, and hate children. I do want to get into because I know you guys have talked about this on 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 your show, and it is a corner of the internet that I'm kind of fascinated with. And I'm talking <laughs> about now that our Chapo Trap House is gone, um, probably the single most charming uh, Reddit subgroup is our <laughs> Child Free. And I so you, you guys have you guys have delved into this on your show, but how would you describe the the, the ethos or, or the the prevailing ideology of our Child Free? And then I have some choice uh, <laughs> selections from from the group. Well, we ha you know there are people who just don't have kids, and that's like 99% of my friends and they're fine, normal people, friends of mine. Then there are people who their whole personality is like being a new atheist except for not having kids, right? So they're like epic science for the win. I did a dunk on someone in public and everybody clapped. It, it's a very extreme kind of exaggerated form of who I am is, is not only not having but actually hating children and their parents, which leads to a lot of funny hijinks on that. Well, it seems like their, their, their main concern is things that take place in movie theaters and toy stores <laughs> because the, I mean, they these are adult common with Kevin Day Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, these are, these are, uh, uh, these are adult men who spend a lot of time in, you know, uh, in, in malls, toy stores and movie theaters and consuming entertainment um, for children. Uh, who are obsessed with the idea that the intended audience and um, sort of uh, target demographic for the products and things that they enjoy are in fact children themselves. And I'm just going to read one here. This is a, 
This is a an, this is an R child free post that I I have to read here. Uh, headline: Is anyone else just fucking sick of Baby Yoda? The stupid, disgusting green <laughs> crotch spawn drives me insane. Who cares if two Yodas fuck? It just encourages crotch spawn mentality and pro crotch spawn spaces. Plus, you just absolutely know some dis- little disgusting, sickly child painted green will win best costume at the opening night of The Rise of Skywalker, despite the hundreds of hours of effort put in by actual fans. Oh, it makes my blood boil. <laughs> oh, this stupid God. green does cunt. He, wait, does he think that <laughs> the baby Yoda isn't a puppet? It's like just a kid. That they <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's Fucking. imagining that he's his uh, his Kit Fisto costume that he spent all that time on will go unrecognized because of some damn kid. Oh, but yeah, what I, what, that's bro, upsetting. what I think is illuminating about that is that he's he's furious at at, at Baby Yoda and a a, a, a as a like a, a Star Wars character that's appealing to children. But of course, like. This the all everyone who cares about this shit does because they got into Star Wars when they were children, and like this, it just seems to be this like weird, like sort of psychological distancing of like hating children in childhood among adult men to cover up for the fact that like emotionally they haven't like progressed past being a child or having an unhappy I childhood. We also have to acknowledge that. We don't know if two Yodas fuck. We don't <laughs> they know they could reproduce, they... uh, you know, parthenogenically. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, I it is canon that uh, Anakin Skywalker was immaculately conceived that's through uh, force manipulation by Darth Sidious. So we don't know how <laughs> beings as powerful as the Yodas uh, reproduce. Uh, but I would think that even if you Doggy hate the style. baby Yoda for being a baby, and if you're one of these people, you would love the baby Yoda for eating all of those. Uh, eggs of the <laughs> space frog thus like aborting a ton of potential crotch spawn from existence <laughs> it's a net win yeah i'm imagining this guy sitting in the theater getting extremely pissed at rise of skywalker not because it sucked but because there are like porgs and they're baby like <laughs> yeah I, lo- I love all- i love all this shit like everyone who gets mad about star wars i lo- like one way or the other are there people who like i don't know for like some political reason they like the new one or they hate it it j- or or like just going through the trouble to get that like Gina Carano fired oh, or yeah. like being mad that she got fired one way or the other because it's like at the end of the day it's like you're you've spent 12 years arguing over like Star Wars the pacifier adventures <laughs> baby force 1 like these are this is just the muppets mm-hmm. that's literally all this is it's this like, is so strictly for babies. And it reminds you that the best way to understand a lot of this very like uh, emphatic cult, like identity based uh, hostility to children is really just the anger of uh, a kid when a younger kid comes into the family. Like, yeah. you're no, I'm yes. baby. Why, why are you <laughs> looking at that baby? I'm baby. Like these, like everyone's an overgrown child and they don't want attention to anyone else. Cause that's what it, kids like. It reminds me of something I did that I'm very embarrassed of that I did when I was, uh, I was like five and there was a kid like probably two years younger than me, like a three year old at the playground. And he jumped down like one set of sets on the, uh, on the playground and his mom went like, you know, good job, Ryan. And I was like, I just went down three steps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I was five, but like, I'm still very embarrassed. Matt by does that. that to our kids all the time to our own children. And he has like, we were at an aquarium one time in Boston and there were a ton of little school kids behind us. And there was a cuttlefish. I was like, oh, look, a cuttlefish. They're really smart. And Matt goes, not as smart as me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like a dozen children behind us. Well, he's, tec- he's technically like, correct. He's technically correct. <laughs> yeah, he's not wrong. My daughter will be like, I can't touch the door. Matt's like, I can. Bam. <laughs> Owned. <laughs> I don't know Owned. what's going to happen with that. Uh, that, is, <laughs> that is an underrated benefit of having kids is you get to feel like a god. Yeah, <laughs> kids, like you don't you don't know that I'm still here after I put my hands in front of my face, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it, here here's one more clip from the uh, Art Child Free that I think sums up a lot of what's going on here. Uh, just reading here, it says. 
society really needs to let go of this idea of unconditional love when it comes to kids. A baby doesn't love you unconditionally. A baby is a bundle of 100% pure selfishness. It wants what it wants, when it wants it. And to be honest, most babies under six months probably don't care much about who. They're just a massive black hole of time and energy. And what I love so much about that is like, he's like, uh, the concept of un- unconditional love as it applies to children means the parent's love for the child, not a, n- not a newborn infant's <laughs> love for its parents. You know, yes, you're right. It's an infant. It, you know, it's, it doesn't have uh, self-awareness yet. It means the fucking parent <laughs> unconditionally loves the child despite it being a black hole of time, energy, and selfishness. But the thing is, this person, they can't imagine being a child, but they can't imagine hypothetically being a parent. And so it, it's all about, well, what about me? Where's... Where is the love for me? It's because it's all it's all transactional. That's that's like they, they, they right. can't even imagine it as being uh, anyone doing anything for any reason other than self interest. I'm surprised that no one has uh, you know floated the idea that little children are abusers. <laughs> they need to be held right. accountable. Honestly, <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. We need to start holding babies they just accountable. They scream at you. They break their promises all the time. Constantly, they lie. They steal the, from you. The They're first kind of violent. thing. They, yeah, the first thing they do, really, the, that they learn how to do is gaslight. <laughs> <laughs> like, little kids gaslight probably more than anyone. Jane takes credit for everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like, I mean, she told Matt that she and God made all the buildings in our city <laughs> together. <Yeah. laughs> Just straight face, no joke. Yeah, Just she's like, like yeah. yeah, we did that. Mm-hmm. We made that one. <laughs> and I was I was extremely gaslit by that. I think the other thing about child free that I always notice that's really funny and, and again makes it feel like an extremely immature place is that there's a lot of emphasis put on how disgusting and kind of just wrong and maybe even like kind of pedophiliac it is that sex makes babies. <laughs> They're like fucking furious about that fact. Well, I mean that was whoever decided they should be brought into the world that way really <laughs> fucked up <laughs> i mean i understand that you know it's maybe not what you expected to hear when you were a little kid but the they'll they i think that's why they focus on stuff like crotch spawn yeah right? i mean how how disgusting it is they feel they're made by sex there's sex and then there's a baby and close pro and they're the vagina oh, nah, this is unacceptable and i'm like yeah man i mean most people come to terms with it at some point i mean i, I don't know it just seems like um, like you know, whether you're on the the the, the left or the right, like, and I, I remember like probably like one of the one of the times I've got like in the most trouble for something I've said on the show is when I simply answered a question by saying that it's okay to have kids if you want them to, despite how fucked up the world is, and like a lot of people, I don't know, like it's just people's anxiety over that, and it's just like regardless of what you may think about the environment or you know having or not having kids, it seems like it's a bad situation for like any any culture or civilization if like a critical mass of people just decide like there's no point in like reproducing yourself or the human race or just like having a future with people in it. I mean, even, even if you make, I'm not saying like if you coming, there are good and bad reasons to come to that conclusion or whatever, but it's just, it seems like regardless of where you come on the political, like ideological spectrum, it would seem that like job number one of a politics, if worth supporting is like creating the conditions in which like, families can or like you know the reproduction of children and the their transformation from crotch spawn into like you know confident adults would be like job number one or like you would be like policy is about making sure that that's possible yeah i mean it's a it's a a fundamental feature of the the human life i mean i i found it very weird uh you know when i got into this i wasn't trying to uh you know uh, I don't know, encourage people to have kids or make some kind of statement that way. I was just like, well, this is something our welfare state is lacking uh, that others aren't, and it would it would solve a good deal of our problems. So let's go ahead and do it. Um, and and to to see that, no, actually, it's it's extremely charged, and people get very upset about it. It's like I I just don't. I mean, to me, it's almost like asking, you know, well, should we have retired people? You know, it's like what you know. People like, do ask that. I mean, it's like, yeah, but don't open that door, Matt. I mean, well, not even not even should people retire, but I guess I would say, should we have anyone over the age of seventy? It's Didn't like, that I, who was yeah. it? The fucking well, who was the Obama guy who said like? Oh, uh, it was uh, Rahm Emanuel's brother. Rahm Emanuel's brother. 
beyond yeah, 75. Brother. Yeah, so yeah. we should just be doing Soylent Green shit and wheeling them in and just yeah. turning I know, them into and, nutrients. And, and it was slurry. fascinating. It was, it was fascinating our, the way Ari and Rom's brother. Yeah, it was uh, Zeke Emanuel. The doctor. Zeke Emanuel, who's like one of the top like brain surgeons in the country. Like, and the way he justified it was fascinating, too, because he was like, yeah, sure. Like, if you're above 75, like, and you may say, like, oh, you have a productive life or it's fulfilling to you because you like going on bike rides or reading books or cooking a meal or taking it easy. But he's like, by my metric, that doesn't count as a productive or like justifiable life. And it's just like, speak for yourself, asshole. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, he, he, yeah. He's, he's, he's saying other people, what other people value is not important. Only what he values is without wondering whether in fact he's the psychopath for wanting to <laughs> spend all of his time working. Well, um, I mean, it's taking, he's taking seriously the ideas of our, of our society, which is that you are as valuable as your productive capacity and okay. small children and old people are not productive. So what do you do about them? And if, if there's no obligation to anybody who can't help you and who cannot ha- like who you, whose productivity you can't benefit from, then the answer has to be, uh, you know, you just uh, let's see what happens. Or maybe you have to be more proactive than that. Or, but or they, we need- they have to be they have to be worked out of the equation at some point. Yeah, we can't we can't just straight up kill people past a certain age because that would be monstrous. But what we need to do is create we need to disincentivize living past a certain point. Yeah. And the thing is, yeah, like, it's like, like uh, it's like self deportation for yeah. the, uh, the astral plane. But like this is so cr- like how short like <laughs> how short sighted is this? Cuz like yeah, children in the immediate like, you know, short term are are not producing. In fact, they're only taking from society, but like that's because you're investing them in in like in one day them being the workers or like, you know, people maintaining the fucking civilization that they're going to inherit. And old people have fucking been doing it for decades. I mean, even based on like this stupid like having to justify yourself to like be breathe oxygen on this planet. It would seem that like the old people have earned it, and that the young people are like you know uh, you're inve- It's not just like a drain because they're going to be productive later in life. Like they, in fact, will be more productive the more you invest in them. Right. The kids are learning. The people who are in the middle, they make hay while the sun is shining, and then there's a time for people to rest and look back with life on sa- in satisfaction. And that they think that's one of maybe Weber's original points in in thinking about disenchantment is there was a point where in history you could, you know, finish your work in this life and rest and look back and say, yeah, I worked, I did my part, and that was it. And that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, you still work, you work until you die in this country. And also kids are, are you know, though people get mad if you say they're non-workers or, you know, workers in waiting, everything about our education system is optimized to make them good workers or better workers or to, you know, kind of compete well in the meritocracy. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just part of living in a really disenchanted society that eventually people are going to come around to, why are we here at all? There's no point. Maybe there shouldn't be any people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just an algorithm. <laughs> yeah. We can all live on We can all live on the cloud. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, to just segue slowly from the problems of uh, re- reproducing the human race and all of the uh, all, all of the negative externalities associated with um, continuing life on the planet, uh, let's get into um, just like the day to day problems of having a family, living. What is polite? <laughs> what is what is a ghost to do? How do I get out of certain awkward social situations? And to that end, I think it is finally time for us to return to my favorite advice column, dear prudence. And Matt and Liz, you are the perfect sounding board to answer other people's dear prudy questions. You guys ready? Oh, Lord. All righty. Yeah. Let's okay. do it. All right. Okay. Well, this first one is a pretty common problem, and it comes up a lot. And I'm just going to read here. It says, Dear Prudence, my sister-in-law, uh, my sister-in-law and I have very different political views. Actually, my entire family and I have very different, different political views. I'm liberal, and they aren't. My parents and I had a very intense argument before the last election such that we've mostly avoided discussing politics ever since. I only see my sister-in-law with my parents and we're not very close. During most of the recent election, my brother told me that my sister-in-law and my mother spent a lot of time sharing conspiracy theories. She left out our family group texts and unfriended all Democrats on Facebook. She told my brother and mother that she wants nothing to do with me because I am a communist who wants to kill babies. My brother says she has lost her mind and told her that I am no such thing. 
My mother, to her credit, told her to get a grip. If it were just my brother, I could deal with avoiding my sister-in-law and be fine. However, they have an 18-month-old daughter whom I love as if she were my own. I have no children, and I'm, I am her only aunt. I would be devastated if my sister-in-law prevented me from seeing my niece. My brother wants me to talk to my sister-in-law. I'm at a loss. She is already pretty irrational, but she is taking this to a whole new level. Should I try to talk with her? What in the world can I say? I know there is a real possibility she won't even speak to me, much less listen what I have to say. So, yeah, this is a common thing. What to do about um, uh, uh, family relations that uh, have b b come to a schism because of our contemporary politics over Donald Trump, QAnon, and um, elite cabals of Satan worshiping pedophiles? <laughs> well, Matt's parents are woke. Kind of oh, yeah, yeah. I don't have this problem. Uh, well, I, 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 well, my mom is um, is apolitical. She doesn't really care. Uh, I did call her up during Alpha. the during this primary, you know, because Texas was a key state. And I was like, I actually called a lot of my family members up and I was like, hey, guys, I need you guys to go vote for Bernie. Um, <laughs> like, it'd be helpful for me. Um, you know, I'm tied in close, you know, and they're like, OK, sure. <laughs> that yeah. was it. Uh, my dad has some uh, politics. I think he voted for Bernie on his own. He voted for him uh, in 2016 on his own. But uh yeah, I don't. I don't really have these issues that other people have. <laughs> I can feel this one. My family's, uh, they're my family is all Trump people. They're all right wing, and I try to, I try to be completely honest with them, and in so doing, make it com totally impossible for them to understand what my politics are, what I think. Um, so my parents will be like, "Y'all gonna go out and vote for them Democrats again?" I was like, "I hate the Democrats. I don't know." <laughs> I don't like Democrats. Yeah, if, you, <laughs> if you turn, if you turn the, if you if you go far left enough, you can, you know, it's it's the horseshoe theory, right? You can, can kind of just be like, yeah, those libs are just losing it today. <laughs> and my my dad will be like, do you see that 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 bullshit welfare Biden's trying to do? I'm like, it is bullshit. It's easy like that. Yeah, absolutely. So you have to, um, uh, but so you have to sort of like uh, <laughs> veil your politics in such a way that you end up agreeing with them for reasons that they're not fully aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would I, I just kind of mystify it. I don't know if that's um if that's a if that's a generally applicable thing. I mean, I you know, I would also, I guess, in all seriousness, recommend um, talking to the sister in law and, and being like, look, I'm not I'm not a communist. Trust. Trust me. I'm a Biden voter. I'm nothing close to even a, a soft socialist, I think. Um, you know, people should pretty much only get what they can get through the labor market. And I believe in private markets and I have no problem with capital ownership. Um, <laughs> I like submitting to my boss and I think you should too. And um, the fact that people get sick and they can't pay for their medicine, I think that's good. I like it. I wish we had more of it. And um, I don't want to kill babies. I'm just indifferent to their fate. <laughs> And then, you know, maybe she would, you know, realize that they're not so different would be I, my advice. I mean, I think I, I think that's very good advice. But like, I mean, the other thing I, I would consider <laughs> saying is like, look, like uh, I hated that Trump was president. Now that now you hate that Biden is president. You think that everyone who supports him is evil and, you know, vice versa. But in another four years, it's just going to it's just going to switch again. Like, like, the, like, the, 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 this shit is never ending. Like, there's like no, no side is ever going to get like, you know, is ever going to be able to like dust their hands off and be like, well, and that's that. We finally won. Unless, of course, you're just get a it, capitalist. Yeah. But I'm saying, like, as far as the day to day <laughs> arguing over this shit, it's just be like, you know, calm down. You know, you'll, you'll win the next one. And then we'll be, then you'll, then you'll feel superior to me. But like, you know, this idea, yeah, well, this, people, this they, apocalyptic they, feeling about presidential elections, just be like, calm down. It's only for four years. You're going to, like, they're, they're going to swing right back again. Right. And their uh, people's egos get very tightly wound up in political teams, I think. Um, and I, I always just try to, you know, and I think one of the reasons, for instance, Bernie is one of the most popular politicians in the United States is because he is an independent. He's not in one of those teams. So it's totally possible for just about anybody to, you know, be open minded enough to listen to him because it's not threatening to their ego in that, in that way because he's not from the opposite team. So when I'm trying to talk to people I know disagree with me and trying to get along, I'm like, look, I don't I'm not batting for anybody here. I have my views personally, uh, you know, but I'm not asking you to to give yours up or anything like that. And I'm not I'm not coming at you as an antagonist, you know. So who knows? 
Yeah. All right. Well, that well that first question is, is a fairly a fairly standard one, and I think it's, there's a chance that like it's it's a real problem that you know listeners of the show may may confront themselves, or it's just fairly easy to understand, fairly relatable, fairly common. Uh, this next question is a genuinely insane one that I'd be shocked if any any human being has ever encountered this problem. So let's dive into it. Question: Weighted blankets. My brother has a new girlfriend whom I have never met in person but we have had some virtual introductions. She moved in with him in April, two months after they met. I sent them holiday gifts, and two weeks later received one of these gifts, a weighted blanket, back in the mail. His girlfriend believes this was appropriating autistic culture, though she's not on the spectrum herself and has no autistic people in her life. She demanded that it be returned and insisted she and I will have no more virtual engagement until I apologize for the insensitivity of the gift. She also posted some things on Facebook about what a monster her boyfriend's family is for giving such a gift. It hurts that my brother chooses to play along with his girlfriend. I would feel really terrible if I did something truly offensive here, but my weighted blanket has been a huge comfort to me over the past year. So I mean, this is dude, the booty okay. cannot be I, I, that good. Okay. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, there is no, no I, way, dude. I, I, Run! I, what the I fuck, have, man? <laughs> I have some advice. I have an, some advice here for the brother. Yeah, uh, take your hands, sort of make like a C shape. The thing that your piss comes out of, grab onto that, move it up and down, and <laughs> wait until you feel good. And you can do that instead of what you're doing now. <laughs> I mean, I think I think we all agree with it. We all agree with the answer here. I mean, the the girlfriend is a monster. Uh, Giving a weighted blanket, uh, just buying a weighting blanket, I mean, is is hugely problematic. uh, That she should be cut off from the family for sending that gift, in my opinion. Only Matt can speak to this because he has the identity position. Why is this lady? I mean, why is this lady so worried about uh, autistic culture? Like, what's her what's her connection to that? I guess we don't know. Um, She just wants. She she respects it. Yeah. <laughs> just she's just an autistic respecter. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously weighted blankets, you know, it, it can't be a, a a product that's only for autistic people. That wouldn't that's not a big enough market. I mean, I feel like she's not she's not being very autistic and thinking about this. Like uh, it just would not be viable. Um, wouldn't that mean like if it's for aut- wouldn't just like that mean that like every woman is autistic? <laughs> <laughs> like every woman has one of these. Like, <laughs> no, every woman is uh, is problematically uh, appropriating. appropriating it and yeah. needs to be held accountable. Man, this girl, this girl's like the John Brown of autistic people. Do, what about the what about the uh, <laughs> the true warrior? What about those uh, bl- those weighted things they put on dogs? Does that count? Like a thunder shirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All dogs have autism. <laughs> uh, all cats have BPD. <laughs> That's true. It's true. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt about that. I'm an I animal mean, expert. Obvious answer to the question uh, for this person is like, uh, your brother has been dating this person for like a couple of months. Like, there's no fucking need for you to apologize to this person, talk to them, or fucking apologize in any way. Cut them off. Bye bye. Don't need, don't need yeah, to, don't, don't do not them. need to flatter the fucking uh, insane person. Is this like the first girl who ever like held her brother's hand? <laughs> <laughs> like, nothing, like just putting up with this as an adult male. I mean, I guess there are like some guys out there who do like they enjoy feeling bad and they like the idea of just like some woman fucking yelling at them all the time. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, biggies. yeah, I don't know. Th- this guy. Man, see, he he's got some work to do. <laughs> or or just count. lean into it and yeah. ne- on the next holiday occasion send her like a model train set or something. <laughs> <laughs> Stimming toys. That would, that would that would be fun. That would, that would be funny. They have their first like Christmas after the vaccine and they go to the mom's house and it's just all puzzle placements <laughs> <laughs> instead of a carpet. <laughs> she should um make a donation to that bad organization that Oh they, yeah. Uh, Autism don't. speaks, I think. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. right. Yeah, yeah. Why is that a bad that's organization? That's the one that's apparently bad. That's our, that's our parent company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they say about it. Yeah, mm. uh, they should see that see a movie. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yes. I Arrange a big family screening today, for, for huh? music, the new film by Sia, which I which I'm told is oh, man. quite good, featuring uh, quite the, something. The girl from Dance Moms. Oh yeah, really? Maddie. 
Yeah, they got oh, the right. girl. She was in the Shia LaBeouf video. I'm yeah. glad she's still getting work. <laughs> she's she's <laughs> she went from dancing, you know, ballet as a ten year old to playing an autistic person in a Sia produced movie. Look, and just to, before I get raked for watching Dance Moms, it was Matt who decided that we needed to watch Dance all Moms of is Dance incredible. Moms. You guys should check it out if you haven't. <laughs> uh, uh, Matt and Liz, have you guys checked out Love After Lockup? Oh, no, no, I haven't. That sounds right up his I'll alley. Put that on my list. Put that on yeah. the queue. You can come back and have a full episode to discuss that show. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Uh, uh, next one. This is a doozy here. Question. How to set boundaries with my neighbor. My roommate and I have ha- been having more backyard fires as a safer way to see friends during the <laughs> pandemic. Our one neighbor, Kay, is in her 50s and keeps inviting herself over when we are having a fire. She usually dominates the conversation, complaining about her kids or work, and she won't take the hint to leave when we are ready to pack it in. We've tolerated, up, we've tolerated it up until now because she doesn't seem to have any friends of her own and the pandemic has been difficult for everyone. However, last night she crossed the line. A friend, B, was over for a socially distanced backyard fire and B agreed to pee in a discreet corner of the yard by the shed because she wasn't in our house bubble. Later, Kay walked up to our back door and peed where a welcome mat would normally be in full view. We were shocked and didn't say anything to her at the time, but her bathroom is literally next door. She was already making us feel uncomfortable, but this act was the final straw. How do we tell her that we don't want her inviting herself over and peeing on our doorstep anymore? See, now that's a question where the answer is in the question. How do you tell her that? You say, uh, don't come to our house and piss on our front door, you fucking lunatic. What the fuck is the matter with you? All right. I think, I think, I think Kay kind of snapped. <laughs> I think that, yeah, Kay should fight the girlfriend from the previous <laughs> Two different types of great women. Uh-huh. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know, man. That's the point where I think you just gotta be explicit and be like, hey. It know, honestly so yeah, well, like yeah. this, it honestly feels like what they're actually asking is, could you ask? Yes, her exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a, yeah. yeah, because like what the fuck is this question? Like, she literally gave you the best out possible where it's like, Yeah, you like pissed on my floor. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it it's like this question is either like it's part of some like ongoing like public degradation thing that they enjoy, or it's like they're hoping that she reads this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and that's, the only that's idea. how she'll get the message. But like, I, I love, I, that I idea, love the idea that she might she does read it, but she's like us. Oh, I guess other people like to piss on uh, people's front doors either. I want- <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna send this to my friends. Some people are really uptight about this. Uh, it's cool that you're cool about it. Though. <laughs> I uh, this is like people inviting themselves over getting in your way dominating the conversation and then pissing on the floor is where child free and <laughs> intersect. <laughs> is exactly what it's like <laughs> I, I love that she does point out that like her actual bathroom is next door and the friend asks, yeah, like you know like, like hey like just just go behind the uh, behind the shed it's fine it's not a big deal and then like and then Kay saw that and was like aha the permission has been granted. It is a blanket, a blanket agreement that everyone can piss anywhere around this house. <laughs> yeah. This is this maybe there is a there's an intersection here with another subject. She just needed a like a codified, explicit set of rules. See, this you know. is why the Napoleonic Code is better than English common law tradition. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to spell it out. Some you just put a list of rules up in your backyard, like in Caddyshack. That's like. Don't piss on the floor. Don't piss on my house. Uh, you know, don't come unless you're invited, etc. But I, I mean, I do like the idea, like, 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 Matt, you're absolutely right. This person is hoping that someone else will confront this woman for them. And like vis-a-vis this woman reading Dear Prudy and being like, ooh, is that about me? But I like the idea that this is someone already so cracked that they would piss on your welcome, Matt, is going to read that and be like, ooh, did I overstep the mark? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, this is like someone who does that is not going to be like, Oh, silly me. I <laughs> I, mis- I misread the situation again. I always do this when it comes to pissing. Yeah, I, I, I was there alcohol involved. I mean, this just the series of events is very hard for me to understand. Yeah. Uh it seems like maybe an alcohol type thing. If someone is just completely sober and peeing on your your door, that's a they're trying to make a point. Yeah, that's someone you can get out of your house with a butterfly net. <laughs> it's like allowed then. <laughs> yeah, castle doctrine applies, I yeah. think. 
Yeah. I have to accept what you're saying here is that, you know, you, you have a problem with me. So, okay. <laughs> I'm just basically like being invited over to someone's house. You know, like I'm, I'm trying to respect the COVID bubble. So I take a shit in their backyard and I'm like, I dug a hole. <laughs> I dug a hole. You provided a trowel that I found in the shed. What do you want from me? It would be funny to walk in on your friend who's staying over. <laughs> You're like setting up the couch for him and you come back in and he's just dragging his asshole on the carpet like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> He's like too shy to use the bathroom. He's like, well, you weren't around and I couldn't ask, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you go. I mean, proof once again yeah. via Dear Prudy that neighbors, in-laws, and friends are a million times more rotten and evil than crotch spawn and children that, that we all have to live <laughs> They're way more problematic to our society. And I think uh, just America, American policymakers should look into ways to disincentivize um, their existence. Yeah, there should be a child income deduction. You have a kid, you pay the price. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care of it. Well, that uh, I think that does it for uh, our episode today. I would like to thank uh, Matt and Liz Brunig for joining us. And Matt and Liz, if people want more Brunigs, they want more People's Policy Project, uh, where should they go? Uh, the Brunigs podcast is patreon.com slash the Brunigs. And uh, my think tank, People's Policy Project, is just peoplespolicyproject.org. 